Welcome to this episode of Downstream, Navara Media's interview series about the culture we live in and the way it shapes our politics. And our next guest has been at the center of a really seismic cultural moment. I mean, if you were played by John Boyega in a film of your life, you'd, feel, you'd be feeling pretty good about it too. Um, the small act series of films directed by Steve McQueen has been a spearhead for the revival of interest and interrogation in black British history. So very pleased to welcome to the show former police superintendent Leroy Logan, MBE, founding member of the Black Police Association, author of Closing Ranks, My Life as a Cop, and the inspiration behind Steve McQueen's Red, White and Blue. Leroy, welcome. What can I say after all that introduction? Um, what a CV. It, it, it is actually pretty impressive if I say that myself. <laughs> um, I also for, for, think... a, for a young, humble start in, in Islington, I won't mention a football team because we've read that. Uh, and, um, you know, it was, uh, you, well, you don't know where you're going to end up just to have that. And I'm not talking about possessions, I'm just talking about just being current and feeling you're in a conversation that needs to be had at this present time. I couldn't think of anything better. I would just be on my wildest dreams. I mean, you're also the first copper we've ever had on Navarra Media. So wow. should I be making a run for it? Do I need no, a lawyer? No, I, I, I can't run that fast anymore. And <laughs> okay. um, I, 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 I used to really sort of, um, and a lot of my ex-colleagues hate me for this, but I used to pride myself for the least number of arrests that I make. Not because I let people off, but I think there's so many ways of signposting people. So if I see them showing the signs of going the wrong way, I'll say, well, okay, let's, let's try this way before you get into something really crazy and get yourself in trouble. So and I would like to think the intervention and prevention is the way that I've dealt with things, not just feeling with someone's color. So trust me, I'm your community cop or community ex-cop. I have nothing but an open mind. But if I get any evidence, I'll be around in a jiffy. Yeah, well, you know, I've never been uh, that diligent when it comes to cleaning up after my crime scenes. So it's not going to be hard. <laughs> um, for those who might be unfamiliar, talk to me about your journey to joining the Metropolitan Police, because in so many ways, you just were not typical of the recruits of the early 80s. And not just talking about ethnicity, also your background in the sciences. Um, what made joining the police an appealing move for you? Well, it wasn't actually that appealing. In fact, it was my worst nightmare. But it was just one of these um, voices that resonate in your head, you know, this calling saying that whatever you thought you're going to do, forget it. Uh, this is the new calling. And because I was a scientist, did my science degree, got an excellent job at the Royal Free Hospital, thought my life was set in clinical research and a sequence of events started to transpire. It started with certain um, local officers from Hampstead that I didn't know were actually officers were using our bar and leisure facilities, you know, the gym, the sports hall, even the swimming pool. And they then revealed themselves that they were local cops. And I, so I saw the personal side before the sort of uniform enforcement side. And I remember that I, I didn't have a great love for cops, you know, growing up in the 60s and 70s with the sus law and all that went with that. And I thought, wow, but these are nice guys. But then again, I realized policing in Hampstead is totally different from policing in Hackney. So they can afford to be nice. And it was nice surroundings, you know, and it was non-confrontational. So it wasn't a stop and search. Point. And then my boss was doing my appraisal um, about the same time. And, um, oh yeah, by the, by the way, these officers started to take me on drive rounds uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in the back of the car and checking out what they were doing. I thought, well, this is a good job. Yeah, it's, yeah, I could, I could consider it, but not quite, you know, not enough. And then my boss was doing my appraisal and he said, Leroy, you're a good scientist. You, you work well together, no problem about your performance, but I just can't see you 
being a scientist for the next 30, 40 years. So I said, what, what do you think I should do? He said, well, you're an outgoing person. You're a people person. I hear they're doing a recruiting drive for cops from minority groups. Would you like to join? I think you should join. I said, and I thought, do I look like a racist to you? Uh, you know, that was my immediate thought. And I thought, this is, uh, this is really weird. Soon after these officers trying to get me into the police. And um, so I went back to my, my fiance, Gretel, who's still my wife after all these years. And she said, um, maybe something you should consider. I said, Gretel, that's not the answer. No, you're supposed to be talking me out of this. <laughs> and the final thing was my, my best friend, Lee John from Imagination fame, his mother is a, used to be a community liaison officer. And she, I told her, mum or auntie, I, I, I'm really f feeling in a bit of a dilemma here. And, um, and I told her, and she said, well, maybe that's the reason I should join. We need people to join. I work with the police and they're always looking for people like yourself. And I agree with your boss. I don't think you're going to end up in a lab for the next 20, 30 years. And, and, and it just, well, that was it. It just created this, this sort of momentum in my, my mind and in my heart. I'm thinking, God, she's this real. And I remember in Jamaica, I, during my primary school stage, in my, my education, and I went to Jamaica and I was living out there for a few years. And I remember seeing black cops and black teachers and, and I thought, I, I remember them in their red seam and their blue seam. And I thought, wow, maybe there's something in this. And then I also remembered when I was doing my degree, I was running from one end of the campus to the other and it, there were split, split venues and I was running along the street and I saw this black officer. So I must be about 18, 19. So this black officer in uniform in his marked vehicle and he looked so professional. And I thought, mm. wow, you're a brave guy. I thought, wow, you, 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 you're a role model. And so these sort of things all resonated and I said, okay, 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 I get it, I get it. And I put an application in. I mean, it's interesting that you joined the police force in 1983 and it's this moment of real anti-racist activity and action and mobilization. And on the one hand, you've got things like newer monitoring projects being set up to hold the police accountable to the communities that they're meant to serve. And, and on the other hand, you've got you saying, hang on, the way you change it's from the inside. And I've always been unsure about this. And this puts me at odds with um, the person who I normally consider the font of all wisdom, my mother. And her view on it is that black and Asian people have a responsibility to join the police, to join the Crown Prosecution Service, because our people deserve to be protected and not oppressed by these institutions. And I wonder what you make of that, that sense of there being a kind of responsibility. Because my, my point of view is that I look at the inequalities, the inequalities of the searches, the inequalities of the charges, the sentencing, the convictions, and I go, well, does it matter if it's got a more diverse face meeting out these inequalities? I totally agree with your mother, because I realise from speaking to Auntie um, Jessie, that you need to have a reflective organization because the more efficient, the more diverse your personnel are, the better equipped you are to serve the needs of the community. And the second thing is you can't steer a ship from the shore. You've got to be on board in the captain's cabin, steering that ship in some way. Now I know that that's a big ask, but I felt that's the only way you can do it. You've got to be in it to win it. And there shouldn't be no, no-go area for activism. And I know that's incumbent on us as people who come from different parts of the world, who've settled here, invited to settle here. And when we see there is disparities or injustices or inequalities, we need to step in there. And I, I suppose that goes, that's counterintuitive because most people see the storm. The last thing I want to do is step into the eye of the storm to be part of the solution. And as a result of that, you get this real um, sense that most people say, I'll have nothing to do with them. Whereas my school of thought, especially with Auntie Jessie was, no, you actually have to do 
your bit within it be in the lion's den as they speak i mean that's not the only way in which he made a very different kind of choice um as depicted in the film very powerfully i mean it was a brutal brutal scene to watch um i can't imagine what it must have been like for you and for your family and for your father um your father was assaulted by two police officers while you were in the process of applying to the force and there are lots of people who'd see that kind of very flagrant abuse of power that kind of racist injustice and go i'm not going to set foot in that institution unless it's to burn it to the ground so what made you decide differently because it's one thing to go oh strategically i'll, I'll join this institution to change it but i think it's another thing to feel it so close to home literally so close to home and go i'm still going to join this organization well i suppose that's where the strength of feeling about your purpose sometimes after even override your parents because i you know my dad you know god rest his soul my hero my role model i you know couldn't think of a worst case scenario than any of my parents being assaulted and my my father um was beaten black and blue i mean when i dashed from the royal free down to the whittington hospital and saw him in the a and &E. actually i walked past him didn't even realize it was him and and when i finally saw it was him i was so enraged i mean i mean i'd never want to experience hate as i did unfortunately i had to turn that around and you would think well the worst place to turn it around is within the ranks of the organization that beat him up and you just get, well, there's this colliding of your world, you know, the personal and professional, and how are you going to make sense of it? And it, I suppose some people, it's more than counterintuitive, it's actually madness. Why would you do that? And I just saw that there was, maybe there's something trying to stop me from joining the police. So maybe I should need to be doubly determined to join. And I don't allow my purpose to be stalled because by this time I'm thinking well listen I've got to do this come what may despite the challenges I'm getting from not only my some of my family because Greta was always supportive I always got support from Jesse and my boss but you know my, obviously my father was really anti once he found out and how he found out he was not happy um officers coming to check out where I live, even though I've updated my address in the application process that I now live down the road, opposite the Arsenal Stadium, by the way. I don't want to add that. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> We're going to edit that out. Yeah, We're going to edit, edit that out. out. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, they went there to check out if I lived in the right place. And it was the old location I gave, not the new one. And my dad opened the door and, and they say, oh, your son's joined the police. Shortly after he's been beaten up, he's still got the scar in his head. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I should have told him. But when do you tell someone, especially after the beating, oh, by the way, I'm going to join the people that beat you up. I mean, I mean it was, but, but even when he found out, how he found out, I still had that determined to get on and do what I felt I had to do. And I suppose in a lot of ways, and reflecting on the last 30 odd years, I've realized that I had, what I did was the right choice. It, it sort of felt, it's fallen in line, even to this very day, how things are playing out. I had to go through that sort of crucible fire to come out even stronger, to do what I had to do internally, to withstand the pressure from my colleagues, as well as the pressure from those who were, I could understand being anti-police, they think it are sold out and, you know, to, to really just give, you know, to just stick to the, to the vision I've got. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. I know all these things were just not making up a great deal of sense, but the inner strength and conviction was resonating that I had to just keep going. And yeah, I did in, in June 83. I mean, one thing which I thought was really incredible 
not just about this episode of Small Axe, but the whole series, is that I think that Steve McQueen has a very thorough understanding of the way in which you hold anger inside you when you experience an injustice. It's physical and you feel it in your body and it's turning almost into a substance. Mm. John Boyega played it with this incredible stillness. Mm-hmm. You know, this really, really phenomenal performance. And I wondered just on, on a personal level, what what racism does is that it, it takes away your dignity and it takes away the dignity of, of the people you love in that moment. Mm-hmm. And how did you deal with that rage and mm-hmm. that anger? That was the drive to to change the Metropolitan Police Force, but just on a on an emotional level, how do you begin to process it well as i said i I was thinking this is insane but at the same time i had that strength of character to say listen it excellence is going to be my deterrent if i'm good at my job and i knew i was going to be practically sound um intellectually capable if i could just make sure all of that applies itself operationally i could out do anyone performance wise because I knew because I was fortunate to go to Islington my, where I grew up and so I knew the area I knew the people I had that extra advantage of being a local guy plus I was a bit older you know they used to call me granddad in Hendon training school because I was 26 I was married I had my first child most of them were in the late teens early 20s but I could still outrun them I could still play football better than them most of them and if they weren't hacking up my legs and all that sort of thing. But uh, so I realized having, you know, sound operational um, endeavor and, um, you know, and, and, and sporting, you know, because one of the things in, in those days, sporting wise, you had to be on top of your game as well. That, you know, if you're a physical presence, they may have a grudging respect for you. They might have a total respect, but they'll have a grudging respect saying, don't mess with him, and he's capable, and especially if that, you know, it all goes horribly wrong, you can rely on him to, to, to back us up. And, Is that and, something and, that, that came yeah. from your dad, I wonder? Because I'm hearing that thing you hear from your parents, which is you've got to be twice as good at everything for mm. half as much. Absolutely. And, you know, understand that we have to deal with that in school. And... It went with us through our entire education into our working environment. So it was like second nature. And I I felt that meant that I was more sort of um, ready and I'm gonna land running. Because I I realized that I I had a few years ahead of them and I had to work even harder and, and, and really show my worth. And I wanted to show to the community, I can be an ambassador for you, I can be working with you, even though you might resent me, you might think I'm letting the side down, I'm a traitor, Judas, whatever, but I don't care what you call me. You're not going to define me, just like my colleagues are going to define me. I had that strength of character, a confidence in who I was. And as I said, I saw black cops, black teachers, black doctors in Jamaica. So it it, it gave me such an understanding of what I can do and, and how I'm going to do it. So yeah, it 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 it, 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 it was, I wasn't going to be derailed by any personality or any prejudice or any perception. I was just going to crack on, and and I said if I can do the first two years, I can get on and do the first twenty eight because your your first two years your probationary area, your probationary period as it were. And I remember, I had the worst reporting sergeant that anyone could ever imagine. I mean, he hated everyone. So at least he was consistent. It wasn't just black people. He hated everyone. And um, I just felt if, if this man breaks me, I'll leave. But if he makes me stronger, I'll succeed. I mean, from, from a practical policing perspective, how much leeway did you have to do things differently? You know, if you went to the force and you go, I don't like how things are being done. I don't like the level of disdain for the community. I don't like the level of stereotyping or prejudice. What kind of leeway did you have to do things differently? What would be different about how you did your job? Well, in the early days, you had to choose your battles wisely. I I mean, you would 
the casual racism, the N word, the W word, the P word is being used, not necessarily at me or my colleagues, but members of the public. And you felt, you, you know, where do you start? And because it was endemic in society anyway. But I remember there was one instance when uh, I had about four, four, five years in, and I, in fact, I, I just finished the sergeant's exam, so I was successful with that. And I was working in an, 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 a divisional intelligence unit to analyze data before I got promoted. And I, I was coming out the office, I was doing, doing my turn to clean up the office, wash the cups up and everything. And as I was coming out the office, Officers were dashing out the backyard to a call, an emergency call, and you can imagine the whole tray went up, up and I was covered in tea dregs. And they just looked at me and laughed and ran off to the call. So obviously I'm now I have to clear up the mess, change my uniform, and as I'm come, emerging out the office to lock up, I, um, I hear them laughing in the control room. Oh, you know, these, these people don't even know how to keep the station clean. Oh, you know, they always look the mess. And I thought, do you know what? This is a battle. <laughs> and it was a full control room. And I walked into the control room because I heard the sergeant chipping in. So I didn't direct myself to the, and remember, I'm a constable still. And sergeants are gods. You don't talk back. But I wasn't talking back. I was stepping in first. I'm going to say, right. Sarge, you're supposed to be a supervising officer. Why don't you act like one? And I walked out. But literally, as I'm walking out, you can see drawers drop. Mm -hmm. It was literally tumbleweed silence. And I know that I had to say something. Now, they already knew me as a bit of a community guy, and, and they had suspicion of me because they thought scientists, a bit older, what you're about. By this time, I'm about 30 now, you know, and um, they, they think, what, what are you, some sort of journalist on, on, on the slide or maybe you're going to write a book or something like that. Well, you know, 30 odd years later, they were right. I did. So, you know, it was um, really um, reinforcing them to, in their mind what Leroy Logan's all about. He's a troublemaker. So just got to watch him, you know. And, and he seems to be doing certain things differently because I used to patrol on my own. I never used to um, rely on people to pick me up because, you know, one of the things when you're a probationer, you, to ingratiate yourself, you know, the drivers for the, the van or one of the Panda Mark cars, you know, you'd say, be nice to them and they'll pick you up, especially when it's raining. Oh, get in a car, keep yourself warm. You know, if it's wintry, that sort of thing. And um, as a result of that, I never used to do that. I love. I used to love patrolling on my own. I like talking to people. I like, you know, if it's wet, I'll, I'll pop into a local cafe or a, a local um, area where I can talk to people. And so I, I'd utilize the time that way. And um, so I was a bit of a loner. Uh, and I, I was like that anyway, as a child. So I, I, it didn't bother me. Because again, you couldn't, I wasn't gonna be forced into certain activity by my peer group, whether it's in the community or in in the policing world. So I, I was able to stand strong in myself to say, listen, I can tough this through. I'm, I'm going to get through this. And um, that, that, that for me meant that if I was going to step forward and speak on behalf of myself or others, I wasn't going to worry about being Mr. Popular. And even as a supervisor, if you're going to do your job properly, you've got to maintain that critical distance. And if you've got to speak to your your team and they might not be doing things as they should, I realize you've got to, I'm not going to be just your friends. I'll be your colleague, yep. Yeah, but if need be, I can be your someone who will challenge your performance, hopefully to develop you. But if not, I may have to sanction you. So I, I, I was quite clear on what I needed to do to ensure that you get the best out of the colleague, you know, my officers. And, and so I wasn't worried about being popular. I mean, I suppose there's 
how you as an individual navigated the internal culture of the police. And then there's the next thing, which is the structural role of the police in society and the role that you're playing within that. And were there ever moments where you felt conflicted about whether the role that you were playing was in the interests of racial justice, community harmony, protecting underserved communities, or in some cases, upholding inequalities and I'll, I'll give you um an example um literally everyone in my family is a social worker it's like growing up in the mafia except everybody's <laughs> doing active listening yeah, yeah and there are these real moments and they'll in, use it against you right oh god they, oh my god no one can hold a grudge like a social worker because they have <laughs> no, a back no. catalog a exactly. back catalog of everything you did wrong from when you were three years old yeah but there are these moments particularly for my mother where she really questions what she's doing and she asked the question of, am I helping disadvantaged families stay together and love each other? Or am I playing a structural role of punishing poor people for being poor in many different ways and for all of the social consequences of that poverty? And just wondering if you as a, as a police officer ever had that moment of going, hang on, am I helping people who are disadvantaged or, or am I punishing them for their disadvantage? Well, I, I, that's a very good question. And, and I remember when I went into policing, I, I made it very clear that my beliefs and values have to be maintained because if I changed that, I would leave in a heartbeat. And I, I realized also with that, my identity has to be very strong. So I said very clearly that I'm a black man who happens to be a cop because here I am in retirement, I'm still a black man. That also meant I didn't just assimilate into the norms and values of the organization. I integrated with my beliefs and values for justice and equality. So that meant I wasn't going to be fooled by pe certain people's actions and say, oh, we're doing it for the best of the community. Oh, just stop and search them. We're saving lives. No. It no, no, hold on. What is the wider impact? Are you adding to their pain? Are you traumatizing them? Are you making barriers and not building bridges? Because that, that's what I was about. Let's build the bridges because we get more information. You know, it was this, I mean, one of the first things they teach you is about Sir Robert Peel, who sat at the Met mm -hmm. in 1829. And he said something so simple and it's so profound even today. The police are the public and the public are the police. And if you keep that clearly in your mind with your own identity, you then will say, well, actually, you've got to have that contract with the, with the public. If you don't have it, regardless how, how they're made up and, you know, whether they're affluent or deprived communities, whether they're crime infested or leafy suburbs, it doesn't matter. You need to be working with them as, and getting the best out of them because they're your eyes and ears. So for me, it had an operational sense because if I am going to be creating barriers, then I'm defeating the whole object of why I joined in the first place. And I might as well pull up the drawbridge and go home, you know? So for me, it, it wasn't um, a, qu a question uh, of, um, you know, I'll just do it nine to five and weekends off and, and, and it doesn't matter. No, it, it has to be 24-7. And I suppose it, it, it really did crystallise itself when we set up the Black Peace Association mm. in 94. Because we, how that came about, where they were looking at the, the disproportionate um, resignation rates of black officers, and they took us to these seminars in Bristol Polytechnic, as it was called then, and how the report we came up with was shelved, not, rec no, not realising that it was the systemic failures. We didn't call it that. We just talked about the culture. And, but it brought us all together because it was every black officer, 95% of black officers in the Met at the time, about a couple of hundred of us, were talking about these issues. And we thought, well, the, the Met might show that report, but we have come together. So they create their, their own monster, basically. And we said, okay, this is how we change internally to improve externally you know change the dynamics the culture the the composition and ensure that we're better serving the needs of the community because there's that inextricable link 
the better you are at serving the needs of the diverse personality, uh, personnel rather, the better equipped you are to serve the needs of the diverse public. So realizing that, we set up the Black Police Association and our overarching aim is to serve the needs of the black personnel in particular, to, so we can serve the needs of the black community who are disproportionately disadvantaged. So that's when it really made sense strategically. And then we had the framework to deal with it. And we had a platform, especially after the McPherson inquiry, mm. we had that platform. And that's, that's when it made sense. In 94, that's when my sense of insanity, <laughs> so I thought, oh, it was literally a eureka moment. 94, 11 years into the job, I thought, that's what I'm here to do. And it was as clear as day. And it was like a commission. It was like, this is your raison d'etre. Mm. And it's been worth it. And it was like, it was like a pat on the back saying, Bright, you've passed the test. The last 11 years, trying to sort things out in your head and who you really are has put you in this position to do this work. I mean, I really want to come on to the McPherson report. Um, I mean, I remember the moment of the McPherson report, even though I was a kid, because everyone was talking about it in my family. It was huge. It was seismic. Um, and it's a tragedy that it took the murder of Stephen Lawrence and, and the institutional failings um, of the investigation, how his family were treated to, to make it happen. It feels like after the landmark of the McPherson report, which acknowledged the existence of institutional racism in the police that maybe we've gone backwards. So Cressida Dick, the Met Police Commissioner said this weekend that nobody is being stopped and searched because of the color of their skin. And I was wondering what you make of her comments. Does this represent a slide backwards in terms of the progress which was made by McPherson? Without a shadow of a doubt. And there's a real irony about this because when Chrisella Dick had left the Met, she, she left, I think, as a superintendent, but she came back as a commander in, in 2000. And she had actually joined to work with a, a, a deputy assistant commissioner called John Greaves. He was Mr. McPherson for the Met. He, he was the McPherson lead for the Met. And she went to work for him. And she was head and shoulders in the mix, really talking race and equality issues, because by this time, myself and two other members of the BPA had given evidence at McPherson to say that police service was institutionally racist. But, you know, in point of the finger, we knew we had three fingers pointing back at us, what we're we gonna do. And it's quite clear, we deal with internal recruitment, retention and progression issues to make a more reflective organization. And, I was also the first chair of the National BPA at this time. So I was working with Jack Straw and Paul Boating at the strategic level to ensure that chief constables were held to account, not only for the internal recruitment and retention progression, but also service delivery and how stop and search and all the disproportionalities. So Jack Straw, masterstroke, he organized the Stephen Lawrence Steering Group and he chaired it personally. And Steve Neville and Dorian Lawrence was part of it. And, you know, major representatives like myself as the national BPA chair. And it really measured progress. Because what gets measured gets done. If you don't measure it, things are just going to be left. If you don't hold chief constables to account, say, well, listen, just like Al, you hold them account for crime and, and clear ups and who's repeat offending. You know, if you call them in the same way, well, well, why is your diversity framework not working? Why is your recruitment and retention figures slowing, slow, slowing down? Whatever. So if, if you treat it in the same sort of way, you will get the same sort of response. So that steering group went on from 99, when the report was published, to 2009. And each subsequent Labour Home Secretary would cheer the group. Well, unfortunately, by 2009, it was being dissolved by, I think it was Jackie Smith was the Home Secretary at the time. And then 2010, the Tory government came in and they decided that chief constables would measure their own 
um, progress around McPherson and all the recommendations. Well, in a can-do success-driven organization, it's like giving a child the answers to the questions of the test. Mm. And, and then after that, you mark your home results. So, so who is going to say, oh, no, no, we're not, we're not institutional racist. Oh, it, um, we can do without that interpretation or that definition. And everything is great. So that's what we've had over the last 10 years. And also austerity has been a major issue because it's in the name of austerity, race and equality issues have literally been knocked off the agenda. In fact, they're no longer discussed, really. Um, they might shroud it in leadership or culture change, but there's nothing about race and equality. And then we had the CRE being disbanded and the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which again, the race and equality issue has been diluted. So you had these sequence of events which cause slippage, you know, because it's not a priority. And so that's why the excellent growth between 1999-2009 of a more reflective organization from 2% to 12% or thereabouts of black and minority ethnic officers. It's more or less leveled off. I think it's about 14, 15%. So that was in the first 10 years, 10% 10, 10 growth. The last 10 years, two or 3% growth. Also, we've, we've seen this massive right wing shift in society through Brexit. You know, hate crime went through the roof mm. uh, after Brexit in 2016. And police are a reflection of society. So you saw that right wing emboldened individual emerging out of the Met. And by this time, I've retired. But you, you've seen it as, you know, working with the police and charity of, uh, work, anti gang work I've been doing. And you think, gosh, they weren't like that when I was in the organization. It's just in their banter, in the way in which they just view things. And, and, and it just reminded me of a pre McPherson era mm. when these emboldened officers think they're un, 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 unaccountable and untouchable and, and, and trust and confidence um, in the black community is lowest because of the experience of day-to-day -day policing. And also community cops have been set back. Um, safer no in schools, safer net, sorry, safer schools officers have been reduced. So th there's this void been left and a disconnect between the police and the public. So, and unfortunately, that void has been filled by dysfunctional role models who groom these youngsters into place. So you've got this real toxic mix of reactive type policing fueling community resentment, if that makes sense. Yeah, mm. community resentment in a way that it's now a them and us. And it's been like that for the last couple of years and it's getting worse to the extent that now you've got a commissioner who's saying stuff that she never used to say 20 years ago. When I met Kres in 2000, she was totally different. But it's either she was being disingenuous at that time or the culture's got to her. It's that she doesn't want to be unpopular. She wants to encourage her officers, say they're not racist, there's no systemic failures, everything is great, and it isn't, especially with the black community who trust the police less than they did, say, 20 years ago. And, they, and then she undermines people's intelligence, or she attempts to, mm -hmm. by saying, well, there isn't anything to worry about, so we don't have to be institutionally racist. But people are saying, especially now with Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. And the whole George Floyd thing, we've had our own George Floyds, you know, with Rashan Charles in Hackney mm. and various other death in police contact. We're not going to buy that. And to be quite honest, I have to be saying we're not going to buy that because, as I said, I'm a black man, I'm an advocate and an activist that you can't fool with this Kool-Aid. I've been there. I haven't drunk that Kool-Aid even when I was in there. So why would I drink it now? 
And Chris, I know you better than this. And if you can't deal with this, you've got to ship out. If you can't shape up, you've got to ship out. And what burns me even more is Sadiq Khan, the mayor, should be holding her to account. And he's not holding to account as he should be until quite recently, he's saying the mayor's action plan that's trying to um, build, um, you know, community activism to buy into work with the police. But people are, are already numb to the fact that police don't care. <laughs> you know, um, they haven't really dealt with their, their, their issues for the last 10 years in effect. And now you want us to just work with us? You know, I'm a great believer. Mm. You, you, you're not going to get a harvest until you till the soil. If you till that soil, you'll get a harvest. But if you think you're just going to get this harvest and you've done nothing to s support and nurture people's trust, why would they do anything? So, and finally, in closing, the, 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 the mayor and the, and the commissioner want to increase uh, black and minority ethnic officers in the Met to 40% in three years. Well, it's taken them 20 years to get to 15% or thereabouts. So what would make them improve dramatically by another literally 100% in three years, it 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 does not make sense, and but that's why I, I, I think they're in such denial. But I put it to you that we've seen with the last two Home Secretaries that we've had, such Javed and currently Pretty Patel, that this is the limitation of being represented mm -hmm. you know Sajid Javed our first Home Secretary of Colours brought in to deal with the backlash after the Windrush scandal and he was brought in as a symbol of change which was never going to happen he was brought in so things wouldn't change with the home office and Priti Patel um even more so not just with issues of immigration but she wants to be seen as tough on policing, tough on lefty lawyers, bring back stop and search, go in hard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so maybe I put it to you that the conservatives understand that representation politics, if you can decouple it from values, means that you can keep the same old, same old and the status quo. And doesn't that present a challenge to the kind of work that you do in terms of representation, that they've figured out how to present the illusion of a changed complexion without changing anything about the culture. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you've hit it on the head. The, the, this whole sort of um, spin of, of certain things is not only impacting on people who might be quite vulnerable to that fake news and that illusion of change when nothing's changed. You know, it's like the, the, the king's clothes type thing, mm. even though he's walking around buck naked, you know. But it's our own people who've been on the receiving end of this. They buy into it. Because even now, they're, they're doing this sort of divide and rule. So you've got your BPAs being around for 25 years, a critical friend holding the organisation to account. They're now bringing in you know, your poster boys and girls of certain individual mandate, they're not even got a, a proper constitutional voting mandate and they use them because it might be quite cool on Twitter or other forms of social media to speak on behalf of the organisation, which is at odds with the staff associations like the BPO who are speaking up for truth and justice. And, and so they, they don't have to do anything and they just say, right, you, do that and you do that and they just watch it all play out in front of them and i think especially in the police that's what they're doing at the moment you know they, 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 there's this real grapple between minority groups in the organization at loggerheads with each other and the white majority are thinking oh, that's cool we can control this and um and i i think they they've got this game plan, you know, um, from the politicians. Because mm. having worked with Boris when he was mayor, that's what he was very good at. 
you know, he'd bring in your Ray Lewis, his gangs are, his drinking buddy. Mm. He would say, right, you know, this is what we do. And he'll hive off, Ray would hive off his favorites and work them against people like myself who could see through all this stuff and think, wow, what is going on? All right, by this time I'm retired, but I could see how we are now becoming at odds with each other. And the solution is the white stallion armor bearing knight coming in and say, listen, we can change things for you and we'll bring in our own sort of token individuals to be the messengers. And mm. even though they're more draconian than any, you know, I, I think Sajid and Pretty are two of the most draconian home secretaries we've had since what made Theresa May look like a walk in a park. <laughs> Did you go on the Black Lives Matter marches this year? Yeah, absolutely. I, I felt compelled to do that because I could identify with what they were trying to do. I mean, they were here a few years ago, but they'd never got the traction. What caused the, the real change for them was George Floyd and see him being lynched that way by an officer who had a similar oath to me to protect and serve brought tears to my eyes. And if there was anything I had to do was show my presence. Now, it so happens John Boyega was there speaking in a way that I could identify with. And the fact that I knew he was going to be playing me shortly afterwards um, it, it, on the BBC just showed that real alignment in the, the, the new generation of young people are not going to put up with these things. They are socially and and, and, and strategically informed that they, they can say that we can make a difference. They have a platform to change. And so I, I know that this movement is not going to be just a moment. It's going to have momentum and it's going to make people sit up. So if I can be an assistance to that, you know, as an old fuddy-duddy trying to do my bit and, and, and if the, my, film with Steve McQueen, Red, White and Blue, and, and the autobiography can add to that conversation, then then I'm, I'm doing my bit because in all honesty, I don't want my grandchildren's generation to go through the same inequalities as my children's generation, my generation, and my parents' generation. I just cannot deal with this. It's got to change. I think it's going to be people power, and young people are going to be front and centre for that. And I just want to see the change being quickly brought in by a change of political will, change of people in authority. Because if they think young people are gonna go away, they're fooling themselves. I see it in Voyage. I see young people saying, listen, this is what we're going to do and how we're gonna do it. They're part of our trustee board. They change the curriculum. They are innovators. And I, I got so much admiration for them. And as we speak, they're at a strategic board changing things in Hackney, which is phenomenal. I wish I was doing that when I was their age. So I'm with, I'm with them and I know that 2021 is definitely going to be an improvement in terms of these issues that young people face. And I believe they will, they will solve them. I mean, on a much sillier point, it must have been pretty flattering to learn that John Boyega was playing you. That's when you go, officially, somebody thinks I'm handsome because of that <laughs> casting decision. You know what? I, I'll never forget my mother for various things. And, and she said, you're the most handsome young man I know. And that was enough. <laughs> so <laughs> so if, if she could say it, I don't care what anyone thinks of me. But yeah, there, there was a bit of validation saying, I mean, well, he's, he's a cool... He's a cool dude, and I must admit, he, he did me so proud. I mean, uh, for me, he brought that role uh, in a way that, I don't know, I don't know many actors, maybe Denzel or someone like that could have, could have done it. But John, for me, made especially those quiet, solitary moments so profound and uh, it made me reflect on so many things. I remember the second time I, I watched it before viewing it yesterday. And um, I must admit, it, it hit me so hard. I, I found myself bawling like a baby because I'm thinking, gosh, how did I get through all of that stuff? And he enacted it in a way that it just brought me back to 
1980s, you know, the early to mid 1980s. And uh, I, I can't thank him enough. He, he's um, He's been a joy to work with and I wish him all the best. And Steve McQueen, what can you say? He's just an icon. He's um, genius. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something. He even influenced my book, The Autobiography. Mm. He, because he was saying, how can you say you love your father and then you still join the police knowing that they beat him up? Come on. I don't believe that. What was it? I mean, it was getting quite violent in the restaurant and people are looking around thinking, what's wrong with these guys? <laughs> you know, all these, why are they looking so aggressive? You know, these black people, why don't they just eat their food quietly? <laughs> that, that type of thing. But no, he, he, he really influenced it. Um, and, and I just have to say, it's my faith. You know, I, I stand strong in my faith that I knew that I had to carry out that purpose, even though my father wasn't pleased. But the great thing was, 17 years later when I got the MBE, and I'm going to Buckingham Palace with my parents and Gretel, and uh, just before I got to go right for recipient's room and left for the um, nearest and dearest uh, reception room, my dad said, I suppose you did the right thing after all. And that was 17 years after leaving and uh, uh, sorry, joining the organization. And I thought, wow, that meant that validation was so important because literally two years later, both my parents would have passed mm. away and uh, that would have tormented me. Um, so just to have that validation just made things so well, it was amazing uh, for me. And, uh, and I'm living that now through the book and the film. I mean, also just like black and brown parents, man, you've got to get the MBE before you get the validation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The bar it's is true. so high. Oh, no, 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 no. It, My it white is tough. friends did GCSE art genius. Wonderful. <laughs> Us lot, man. You've got to get the MBE. You've got to get the oh, Nobel yeah. Prize. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I tell you, our parents don't ramp. They don't no. ramp, man. They, 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 they say, listen, um, and I think it's because they, they know the world we need to operate in. And, and it's got to be a high bar. It's got to mm. be a high bar. And, and you know, my, 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 my children say to me, why are you so easy with the grandchildren and you were so tough on us? I said, well, listen, who else is going to give you a hard time? Who else? If I don't give you a hard time, who else is? You know, so, you know, we, we do it because we love love our children. And um, uh, Yeah, uh, I've it, heard I, that one I, before. I, no, it's, it's tough love. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough love, no. but it's still love. <laughs> I've got um, a quick yep. fire round for you if you're up for it. Go for it. On certain policies. All right, decriminalize drugs, yes or no? So you've got to legalize certain drugs or control it that it's not being used by the drug dealers. Because at the moment, the proliferation of drugs gangs is out of control, especially with less cops around and, and, and less community intelligence to tell you who's doing what, when, or how. So you're in a hiding for nothing. And, and I'm not saying that we just go back and say, oh, yeah, just let anyone get on with drugs. No, you've got to have the infrastructure to, to support people because they're more patients than prisoners. And, 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 and police have to see the, you know, people, especially in, in, not only drugs, but mental health. They are patients, more patients than prisoners. And that's what they did in Glasgow. If you go to the violence reduction unit, I worked, mm. you know, in fact, I was liaising with Karen McCluskey even yesterday. Uh, and, 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 you know, because I learned from, so much from her and what she did 12 years ago around treating people as more vulnerable groups and then working with them so that they are more stronger people and won't go back into their old habits. Mm. Reduce exclusions to reduce crime. Take away the, the, the power from the drug dealers and the criminal elements who can groom people and, you know, um, manipulate them into that type of lifestyle. So th for me, it's a no brainer. We really need to look at our drugs policy because again, it's just like violent crime. You're not gonna arrest your way out of the problem. Mm. You're not gonna stop and search your way out of the problem. And in this day and age of being more cost effective, especially after COVID, Money is going to be really tight. We're going through an, going to be another austerity. Why would you do the same sort of things? Just kicking indoors and, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying don't do that, 
but don't just emphasize on kicking in doors and nicking people when you're not doing the intervention piece and the prevention piece and the diversion piece. So in a, in a, even though it's not a quick fire, because you asked me why, it's mm. definitely change in drug policy. Absolutely. No, see, I, I undermined my own quick fire thing because I was expecting you to say <laughs> no and I got interested, so I wanted to hear why. So that was a quick fire round which didn't didn't go as I planned. But I've got two, a couple yeah. more quick fire questions. Okay. Uh, do you have any sympathy with Black Lives Matter activists in the United States calling for the defunding of police departments? I have no sympathy about the defunding title, but I have sympathy with the concept, which is not far from the public health approach. I wish they would call it the public health approach because it's more or less the same. Um, because what you're doing is similar to what I said with the drugs policy. You're identifying where your assets are not having an, the desired outcome because there's the other thing with this whole performance culture, especially police officers are bought into this. They talk about outputs which is like literally how many people in the cells, how many people go to the courts, and maybe how many times they offend or reoffend. That's what the whole gangs matrix thing is about. And that look at how that that's institutional racism by logarithm or algorithm even. Mm. Logarithms my generation. Algorithms <laughs> is now. Anyway, so th there there is that that real sort of systematic misunderstanding of outputs is only part of the equation. You have to look at outcomes and impact. So the public health approach looks at the outcomes of your activities and the impact. Now, I wish they would, they would really talk about that in America in a similar fashion. Defunding the police concept rings too many alarm bells for people. And I hope Joe Biden really changes that around because it's not helpful. So I agree with the concept, but not the title. Um, I really believe the public health approach, which we're adopting here, is really just changing how you deploy your assets. Mental health. Why call cops to mental health? There's no point. Mm. Because they're not skilled. In fact, they exacerbate things because they, you know, see that person as a threat and they adding to that person's trauma by applying cuffs and rolling around with them and you know it because they have not got the real understanding of how to deal with mental cases so you have to beef up the number of approved social workers that are and also psychologists so that they are the first line maybe you need cops there to protect them just in case but they sh cops should not be the first line to call to you know someone in distress. I mean, we've got so many cases where people have been in distress and officers either taser them mm. or in America they shoot them, mm. which is crazy. I mean, it, it, it begs belief. So, no, I believe in the concept, but not the title of defunding. But if you look at what they're trying to do in America, it's very similar to what the public health approach is trying to do here. And final question Do you really fancy? Arsenal's chances at the lane <laughs> this weekend. You're terrible, you know. You're really terrible. <laughs> Do you really? As Come a, on, as, as, a, as a long, as a long-term gooner, and and, and and I'd like to think, even though the only thing I acquiesced in my life was my my football team, because I I grew up in Ivory School, Ivory Grove School, and if you if you decide to support another team like your Man United's or your Chelsea's mm. or even your Tottenham's, then get ready for a kick-in because that's all they do. It's a boys' school. That's what we're into. Anyway, so I'm a gooner through and through, but I'm a realistic gooner. And just by the form books at the moment, and you've got a very good manager, I think that it's going to be a goal fest, but I think Tottenham are going to win unless <laughs> Arsenal – no, no, seriously, unless Arsenal – really change their shape because what I saw yesterday saddened me greatly. And I mean, I know it was uh, only one goal in it, but Wolves and, and our record at home is <laughs> abysmal. I mean, 
It, it, I think someone was saying it's our worst performance since the 81-82 season. I, I mean, <laughs> that's 40 years ago, for Pete's sake. So, no, I'm a realistic gooner, um, and, 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 and I'll tell you why. Um, and I don't normally admit this, but I used to be a season ticket holder. Oof. And when they moved from the old stadium to the new one, um, my wife said to me, I'll give you five years. If they don't get any silver in five years, we can't afford that X number of pounds to be a season ticket. So it's, it was either keep the season ticket and get divorced. And I thought, <laughs> actually, it's more cost effective to keep no, I didn't. I didn't keep the season ticket. I got. I was going to get divorced, so I got rid of the season ticket. So I, I've been. It's given me a, a, a sense of. Um, I'm a critical friend of Arsenal. I love them to bits. Critical friend. Uh, but I've got to be a critical friend, and 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 I, I'm I'm hoping Arteta can turn it around, but it's not looking good. And I think I mean, Marina. It's I one think, problem you could arrest your way out of. Get rid of Son and Kane, and our season is finished. <laughs> Um, Leroy, thank you so much for joining us today. I don't think you've convinced me away from being a committed abolitionist, but you made some very good points. You nearly got me there. If anyone could have convinced me, it's probably well, you, but not quite. Well, actually, can, can, can I just say, mm -hmm. I, I would love you to be an abolitionist if you, um, if, 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 if you knew that I was going to pray for Harry Kane's left ankle. <laughs> <laughs> You could maybe convince me away from from my, you know, uh, very fundamentalist readings of Angela Davis. Then, if you oh if no you no no oh whoa whoa stop that prayed stop every there. night for for oh, Hurricane, no, then maybe no. you could con convince me. Away. But Leroy, thank you so much you're for welcome, joining us, giving us your time, um, and yeah, thank you for the work that you've done as well. No, no, it's been really good. I I, I really um, like um, interesting conversations and. Um, uh, I think your social working background has helped you to really ask some very, very relevant questions. Thank you so much.